you can turn to the book of Ephesians. We're going to get there in a moment. Uh, you can see what's up. We are talking about the church in these days. Next few weeks, we're going to be bringing a message. I'll be preaching to the entire church family. As we celebrate our 80th, we're going to look at the past a little bit, uh, how the church has been enduring, how we're advancing, how the church is prevailing. We're going to talk about the future ultimately. And uh, really, that's where God always is leaning us, pushing us. But it's great to be with you. You sound great today. Don't you love this time of the year? I mean, fall in Dallas. <laughs> Man. Um, Love it. You got your pumpkin spice thing going or whatever you've got going on, putting on your sweater, just uh, sweating. And, um, and so if you're watching us, yeah, maybe on Facebook Live from somewhere not in Dallas, I'm joking. It's like 95 degrees today, so I think. But uh, yeah, this is that time of the year. But hey, it's coming, right? It's coming. Of course, I'm talking about flu and cold season. Uh, it's on the way. And I'm a bearer of good news, but it's coming, and it can happen to any of us. In fact, a lot of our staff and staff kids um, have been sick. Anybody else? Any families? Anybody? A little something going around? We've had quite a... Maybe it's just us here on staff. <laughs> Didn't know that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's something there. Allergies? Anybody right about now? There's something funky. That's more of us. Okay. Something happening. You know, there's... Uh, I heard Rodney Shell, our executive pastor, he said recently in a... Uh, Park City's Discover, Park City's class, uh, for our new members, pre-members, um, you can come and learn more about the church. He said, if you're planning on getting sick anytime soon, um, you need to get in a connect group, like, right away. <laughs> and if you're not laughing, you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, because what happens, and I give our church really high marks here. I mean, when somebody's in need, when somebody's hurting, when, gosh, when we've had a death or a real challenge in, in a family or, or some, we, I mean, even today, right? We're praying for people in our connect groups, maybe ministry teams that you serve with. And uh, so that's where, you know, our big church gets smaller, are in these groups. And that is a beautiful thing. But it can. It can happen to any of us. Um, some foreign invader, something comes into your body. It's a, it's a virus or bacteria, something that comes in that's not supposed to be there. But God has created us in such a way that we have this immune system in our body, right? And it, and it attacks whatever these foreign, you know, uh, bacteria, whatever else are that come into our body. And uh, because I'm such the medical wizard, I'm explaining this really well. But, um, but, it, but I do know this, it's blood protein, it's antibodies that come in. It's like white blood cells, right? You know this, that go like zapping invaders. They're like, ki- kids are like, they're like little ninjas and they go in and whatever kind of bacteria or something in your body, they go after it. It's happening in your body right now. It happens all the time. You don't even know it. It's why you're not getting sick right about now. And when you are sick, then, then whatever comes in, it comes after you. And just as the, the human body is designed in such a way that there are some real viruses and illnesses and sickness that come our way, and then there's a, a defense mechanism that challenges it, really goes on the attack. In the same way, any organization, a family, a church, uh, can be attacked. And in fact, I would argue that it constantly is being attacked. One of the great analogies in the Bible used over and over again, uh, word pictures for the church, of course, is that the church is a body. It's a body. And you already sense and see, if if you've read any of these passages before, you know that it's, you know, the whole body, different parts working together, whether it's legs or arms or thumbs or whatever else that make it happen. I was with a group of pastors um, that I meet with regularly. I was with last week. And one of them, we were talking about uh, pastoring churches, shepherding, and particularly larger churches here in Dallas. And one of them, one of them said, you know what I've learned is that the church always has this low-grade fever going on all the time. Because we were talking about, you know, it, 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 and sorry, but real talk, family, okay? Uh, as your pastor, I mean, I'm aware, you know, of a lot that's going on and, and not just kind of, you know, my, my little ministry area world or something. And, and the point was that there's always something. You gather a group of people enough. You know this is true at work. It's true on your sports team or at school, your circle of friends. You gather enough people together. Uh, enough of us are unhealthy, all of us, broken, sinful people, though rescued in Christ if you've received his grace. But we still bring something to the mix, right? And, and I've often said that you know, healthy leadership is hard to find. In organizations because it's hard to be a healthy leader. And, and so you don't have, we don't have a perfect church because 
You don't have a perfect pastor. I mean, kind of blow that one going in. And yet the Bible tells us that he has given us a way to defend, to fight against the sickness that comes into the body. And we're going to talk about that today. And uh, in fact, with our 80th anniversary here coming up, I think it's really important to, to talk about what makes for a healthy church. Now, I realize, you know, you might be thinking, well, Jeff, I've got enough struggles of my own. I know you live in church world. You're the pastor. You love this kind of stuff. Listen, you are the church. You saw it just a moment ago. You are the church if you are a believer, a follower of Jesus. So this is for all of us. The church is not a building, as we noted. It's not simply a gathering. It's us on the move. And so today I want to talk about three antibodies, if you will, three white blood cells that we're going to look at that make for a healthy church. Now, before we get there, I love Romans 12. You can see it on the screen there. And these are Paul's words to us, but let's say it together. Let's say all this together. For as in one body, we have many members. The members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Check that out. We are individually members one of another. We are for real connected in a very real way and in a very functional way, as we'll see. We are brothers and sisters, but this is not a biological family. That's not what drives us here. In fact, many of you would say, man, my church family over time Church family becomes even even more important in a lot of ways. Maybe you run deeper in relationships within the spiritual family of God than you do your biological family. Particularly if your family, right, are not believers, not followers of Christ. Some of you feel very much more at home here. And really, it ought to be that way, that here in the church, we're not simply a group of people who like to sing, sing the same songs or or, you know, they pulling for the same football team. I mean, it goes much deeper than that, right? And, and so we're, we're talking about that in these days. What is it that unites us? We're going to talk about that today, the importance of unity. But we are a people not connected by ethnic tribe or zip code or the color of our skin or, or even gender, you know, male or female. Those things don't unite us. What unites us is Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to talk about today, we fight for unity, we equip for ministry, and we strive for maturity. That's where this passage goes. Ephesians 4, I want you to turn there. If you're not there already, Ephesians 4, we're going to look at 1 through 16. Paul spent uh, the first three chapters uh, talking about what Christ has done for us. It's kind of what we do in worship, where we say, let's remind everybody who we are. You know, that this is who I am. And this is what Paul does. He could have written that song we sang earlier. You know, be reminded, this is who you are. So we, we, we say it this way. In his epistles, he first lays out the gospel indicatives. Indicatives are, you know, just facts, just truth. Here's what God's done. He's rescued you from the domain of darkness, and now you are children of light. He's adopted you as sons and daughters into your family. He spends three chapters doing this. He does the same in Colossians, Galatians, kind of that way. Here in Ephesians, he doesn't have a particular challenge or problem in the church per se. So what he's doing is he's saying, I'm going to help you be ready for potential uh, bacteria, viruses, illnesses that are going to come into the body. And so I'm going to set you up and be ready to fight against these things. And so he lays out these gospel indicatives, and now he shifts, and now we, we move to gospel imperatives. He says, in light of who we are, now how do we live? And it's done in relationships. We know this. Uh, life is all about relationships. As we're image bearers of a relational God, a triune God, in perfect love, perfect affection, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were invited into that dance. And that's what it means to be a believer, a follower of Jesus. And so the Spirit calls us into a real world with real people, real relationships. And so let's look at this. We are the body. If you take notes, I've got just a few things I want to say here. The first one is we fight for unity. All right? Look at what he says. We fight for unity. I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. And he's literally that urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So again, he's saying, okay, I, I've, I've spent three chapters here as we would designate those and, and, and organize it. I've told you who you are. Now live up to this. Watch this. It's not so much that we're becoming something we're not. There is that. We're becoming something we already are in him. 
in Christ. This is sanctification. He's already forgiven us, already set us up with Jesus. And, and so he says, now live in a manner then. Live in that way with all humility. Notice that he starts with humility. I wonder if you, you would be described as a humble person. All humility and gentleness with patience, bearing one another in, with one another in love. This forbearing love. You know, I know it's true. You hang out with me long enough, you're going to need to have some forbearing love. And, and, and some of us, we know uh, there's, some, there's some folks that you, in your life, a little extra grace is required, right? A little EGRs, that's who they are. A little extra grace. It's not that they're so jacked up or messed up more than you are. It's just that they need a little more grace coming from you in their lives. And he says, we've got to have this forbearing love, all right? And, and he says, eager to maintain, this word eager, make haste with urgency, be enthusiastic. Let's be hyped about, let's be eager about maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. This is a proactive, eager a sense of, of unity, a desire for unity in the bond of peace. That we'd have peace in the body. There is one body and one spirit. Now watch this. Now he says, here's what unites us. Just as you are called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all. Who is over all and through all and in all. Now that is loaded. But here's what he's doing here. He's saying in verses 4 through 6. Let's not miss this. This is what unites us. And I just want to break this down for just a minute because we get so confused about this. Listen, unity in the body of believers is not uniformity. Uniformity is everybody look like me, think like me, act like me. That's uniformity. Instead, unity is diversity in the body. So it's not uniformity, everybody like me, but it's, it's unity, everyone moving in the same direction. And focused on the same thing. Jesus, to put a name on it, right? Which is why we're, we're here. It's why we worship. It's what we do. Christ is the center of all things. I've said this before in recent days. If we go at this alone, and we say, let's just be, and I get it. Churches come together, kind of homogenous groups of people, because primarily because of the neighborhood you find yourself in. We're kind of in North Dallas, frankly. Dallas is kind of this tale of two cities, and we've got a lot of white people, but we're not all white, and we're not all white here. But I'm convinced if a watching world, I'm talking about the unbelieving world, watches us and says, you all look exactly the same. They're gonna, that's a white people thing. That's a white people thing is what that is. Or we're all from the same spot. Well, that's y'all's tribe. I mean, you know, whatever. If we all look exactly the same, I believe a watching world is going to say, but, but watch this. The, the, the converse goes like this. The reverse is this. Different people from all walks of life. And we do have a diverse church. More than a lot of people know. We've got a lot of folks who have uh, people of color. We, we have our Hispanic ministry. We're cross-generational. We, yes, are male and female. We, we are different in a lot of ways. Lots of generations are represented here. And yet we're one. A watching world says something else is going on there. Where else does that happen? In the world where people are together focused on one thing. But look at what he says here. Here's what unites us. One spirit in verse 4. The Holy Spirit of God is grabbing all people from around the world. He's grabbing Arabs, he's grabbing Africans and Asians and Westerners and white, black, male, female. He's grabbing women and children. Uh, he's, he's grabbing men from all over the world. And, and it's, it's an amazing thing. I've been fascinated, by the way, by the fastest growing uh, movement in the Christian world on the planet right now. You know where this is? It's happening in Iran. The most unlikely place on the planet. And it's happening with primarily women as the leaders. And it's not a church planning movement. It's a disciple making movement. It is amazing what's happening. And, and, and God is drawing people to himself from all over the world. If you want to know more about that, there's a documentary film that's called Sheep Among Wolves. You can find it on YouTube. It is fascinating. And you can watch it because nothing else going on today, right? I heard there's a game later, but do it. Uh, watch it sometime. But these are our brothers and sisters, right? And so the, the point is this, and you all know I'm really passionate about this. Hang out with me long enough. But there's no place for racial divide within the body of Christ. Nowhere. 
Because we're all one body. We're all one family. And he's called us together to serve together. And I think we do this well as a church to partner with others across our city. We want to continue to do that as we move forward as a church. But a divided city, in many ways, uh, needs a united church. A divided nation needs a united church. And right now, the fragility of our nation needs to see the muscularity of the church. And we've got to come together with believers across denominational lines, across the city, and say, we're in this together. And so we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, for instance, it says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. So, so when our brothers and sisters are suffering, we step in. We say, man, when will we suffer with you? I am certain that empathy is the pathway to peace when it comes to divide, even in the body of Christ, to understand. That's why we need more conversations. One spirit. Look at what he says here. One hope. We have one, the same object of our hope is Jesus Christ. He says one Lord in verse 5. Our hope is secure uh, in one individual, the God-man Jesus is the only reason that we have hope. Our unity shows that we are one body with one hope. And if you're here and you're not a believer or you're wondering where you are in that and you're trying to figure this out, you need to know there's, there's just one Lord. There's only one way to the Father. And our coming together proclaims that. And, and, and we do it together. There's one faith. Now, this is not just faith and trust in Christ. This is unity around uh, what, what he's referencing here is really core doctrines of the scriptures. It's why the scriptures are central to all of our connect groups, everything we do. We believe that there's one God expressing himself in three persons. The triune God. He created all things. We believe in original sin. They, they were all, we were all, and this is, this is important. It's not just a behavioral issue. It's not work harder, get better, be more moral than somebody else. Instead, sin is a condition of the heart. We can't rescue ourselves. I mean, this is core to our belief. The virgin birth. Christ has come. He lived the perfect life on our behalf. He died on the cross and he rose again. This is the core of our belief. This is what he means when he says one faith. And look at this. He says one baptism. You've seen it today already. The example of these who were baptized. We're all initiated into the same community. And and I'm going to speak to some of you here. Baptism is symbolizing identifying yourself with the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And to refuse to be baptized by water immersion, to enter into the body, is to embrace disunity and not embrace unity. It's like saying, I want to be on the team, but I'm not wearing a jersey. I mean, I want to play with you guys, but uh, I don't want to be on the roster. Just, you know... Put me in, coach. Um, but I'm not going to commit. And, and the Bible's real clear about that. It's a commandment from Scripture that Jesus tells us this. If some of us think, well, that's not that big a deal. That's like saying, well, then, okay, your wedding's not that big a deal. Your wedding ring's not that big a deal. The symbol of baptism is, is more than a symbol. And I just want to challenge some of you to identify with the church, celebrate. You're proclaiming that he is Lord and it's through him that we're saved. And then then there's one father, he says in verse six, we're all human beings, which means that we're all created by God. But, but, but what that also means is that we're all fallen in sin and sinful. And so we're in need of rescue and he does so. And through Christ, we're adopted into his family. We come around one father as brothers and sisters. What a beautiful thing. But Paul knows we don't, we, don't, we don't enter into unity like it's a, our default mode, okay? And because the gospel moves at the speed of relationships, Satan is always seeking to attack relationships. He's doing it in your, your home right now. He's doing it in your friend group. He's doing it with you, your roommate. He's always moving in. He's always seeking to attack even in the body. And so we've got to be aware on the lookout for what's happening. We, we've got to be wise when it comes to this. But here's what he does. He doesn't simply say, here's how you're united. That's big time. You've got to stay focused. And that's my role in in large part. We've got to stay focused on what matters most. That that it overcomes and dominates everything else. And so there's no question where our focus lies. But then he goes further. Look at this. This is what the Lord has done. Number two here. we, We equip for ministry. Not only do we fight, literally, for unity. We we war against disunity. 
But then he says this. Look at verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, and this is out of Psalm 68, 18, this triumphant Lord. Uh, there's this reference to spoils of victory, but look at what our victor brings. It says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he, he gave them gifts, gifts to men. In saying he ascended, now he offers a little commentary. What does it mean but that he had also descended in the lower region of the earth? In other words, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. He's speaking of Christ who came all the way to earth and now he's ascended. And as he has done so victoriously, he's giving us gifts. And look at what he says. These are gifts. Watch this. He gave the apostles He gave the prophets, he gave evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now in our day, um, you know, there, there are not just staff that are called out to do this, but leaders within the church. There are people who've been called out across the life of our church. This is what makes for a healthy church, that we equip together, we train up, we make disciples together. He brings apostles so that we can fight infection against stagnation and self-absorption. He brings prophets so that we can fight complacency, fight off moral compromise. And he brings evangelists to fight off the infection of a works-based salvation or righteousness and tribalism. He, He brings teachers, many of you, to fight off heresy. And to teach our children that it's not work harder, get better. It's Jesus loves you and now give your life to him in worship. And and our teachers fight against false gospels. And and that's what many of you do. I was in a connect group early with great teachers who are constantly preaching the truth, speaking the truth. Pastors to, to fight off despair, disillusionment, to shepherd the body. He's given us gifts. You see how good he is to us. And it's why we should honor those who God has placed in these positions. Because here's something that really cool that happens. As this takes place, as leaders, those called out, and this is, this is all of us in some varying degree. He's given all of us a gift to serve. So as we do this, something really cool happens. We, we enter into the body like uh, antibodies. And we fight against infections. We fight against uh, diversions of of theology or possible heresy coming up. Or maybe a leader or someone spinning out of control, getting too self-focused or self-righteous. And the body, we go into the body and we correct. The body self-corrects. And we do this together. We hold each other accountable. We love each other enough to say, wait, no, no, that doesn't seem right. And and, and so we, we challenge each other. So just as antibodies, these, these blood proteins go into the body, same thing happens. Watch this. It's as if the very blood of Christ runs through our veins because His Spirit lives in us and together we challenge each other, encouraging each other, equipping one another to use the gifts that God's given us. The body means that we have different parts, right? That we, we do different things, but we encourage each other and equip. So the big question today, here it is. What's your ministry? What has he called you to do? Have you ever seriously asked the question, what do I bring to the body? Have you asked that question? Are you you pursuing a ministry that God has given to you? How can you serve the body? This is so important. Now we'll get back to that. Why are we doing this? What's, What's the end game here? We... We fight for unity, okay? We, we equip for ministry, and then finally we strive for maturity. That's where we're heading. Look at what it says in verse 13. I love this passage. Until we all, because I love the church. This is such a beautiful thing. There's nothing like the local church on the planet. Look at this. Until we all attain the unity, there it is again, of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Okay, like this body that's growing up. To be strong and healthy, fighting off illness and sickness to grow and be strong. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that, here it is, why? The purpose, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. By human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. 
Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I love that. I read Bob Goff recently. He, he, he posted, um, Jesus didn't come to make people Christians. He came to make people love. He came to turn us into love. And of course, perfect love is Jesus. He came to make us like Jesus, but we do this together. Everyone doing their part, every single one of us. So again, the question is, what is your ministry? What is your part in the body? You might be, again, you might be a thumb. Man, we need a thumb. Um, you might think, man, I don't, I don't bring a lot to the table. I hear that often. No. I, I was talking to brand new members last week, and I said to them, we're a better church because you just joined our church. Oh, no, we, no real, not really. We don't bring a whole lot. No. I mean, for real. Like, no, you've got the wrong vision of the church. You're gifted and they're believers. I said, we're a better church now because something was not happening before you got here. And it's about to happen. That's true for every one of us. But what part of the body are you? You may be a heart. I mean, you're passionate you're keeping blood flowing through our veins. When you show up, everybody, man, I'm a, you, that's contagious. I get excited when I'm around this person. I mean, you might be, a, you know, be the brain. Like, you're really smart, smarter than the rest of us. We need to hear from you. You need to speak more, you know, that kind of thing, right? Maybe you're the, I don't know, you could be the big toe. You could be a, a, a knee. You can, be, you can be ear. I mean, some, like some of you... Of course, nobody in this room, but I, I've heard this. That, you know, some might be like, you might be like, you're the appendix? I mean, what, what are you doing here? And we're like, we're all kind of afraid. <laughs> like, you might blow up any minute and just <laughs> kind of take us out. We laugh, but let me ask you this. What's your ministry? How are you serving the body? Well, Jeff, man, I am tired, bro. I mean, all week long, I just want to come here and sit. Here's what happens when you come and sit. I see this so much at the time. Coming to sit and just receive and not give. Real talk. Okay, here we go. You become a consumer, naturally, and then a consumer becomes a critic. And a critic becomes dissatisfied, even bitter, and wondering what is wrong with my church. You might be wrong. Maybe it's you. Maybe because you've got in your mind, over time you've come to believe that the church is for you. And yes, I get it. You've heard me say it. We're for each other. And there are times when you just need to come and say, I need others to help me. I mean, that's all of us. So, so don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm saying to those of us who seek to serve the Lord. We've all been gifted to do so. So I want to challenge you to be the church. Now, some of you, I'm going to take a turn here in, a, in our sermon moment here before we close. Some of you may think I'm too old. Uh, I'm, too, I'm too young. Maybe some of you might be thinking I'm, uh, I'm, I'm too female. <laughs> I'm a woman. I'm a girl. And because you hear so much and see me, male, or Travis, or you see a lot, you hear from a lot of men around here. And so we thought it'd really be cool before we close our time to talk to a couple women, okay, before we go today. And so I'm going to invite, I could have chosen lots of women. I'm looking across this crowd today, but um, I've asked Megan Thurman, who y'all see a lot, but really may not know so well, to come up here and join me. And I've asked Jess Barfield to come up as well. So they're going to come up and, and take a seat for a moment. And I'm just going to talk to them, okay, two women, and uh, we're going to just chat about what it is to be a woman. Now, let me place this in context for a sec. Some of you know, of course, the Me Too movement that has kind of sprung up over the past couple of years has also then entered into the church conversation. I think it's emboldened women to say, maybe we can talk about some things. Uh, last July, the Houston Chronicle came out with an article that was actually targeted towards a database of, of, that, that they formed 
of people in the Baptist church. I mean, I'm talking about sexual abuse. And so they start getting real close to home, right? And that's not what this conversation is, but I'm saying that we've got some issues. And behind it might be th- some theological challenges that we've had or, or our own traditions that have set this thing up. So we thought it'd be good to just come together and talk about it. Okay, so thank you, first of all, for being a part of this conversation. Um, I love nervous. these two right here. Are you nervous? These two right here are, are amazing. I, we, we did, a, we did a, um, a survey early in the, in the year, and we have about 57% of our, of our congregation are women. And some say it's as high as 63% around the world. And so women play a big part in what we're doing here, right? Our, our church would shut down if it weren't for women. But we want to have a conversation. So, Jess, I just want you guys to introduce yourself first. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, I'm Jess Barfield. Um, My husband and I have been married for almost 10 years, and we have three little boys. They're six, five, and one. Um, And we've been members here for about four years. Yay. Yeah. And I'm Megan uh, Thurman, and I'm married to Corey Thurman, who's over there. We have two little girls, uh, Willa and Reagan, and they are almost four, almost two, and we have been here for about a year, Um, a little over a year, I think, actually, and... Yeah, and I lead y'all in worship, and I truly love it. Love Yay. It. So, you have kids. Are they well? Are they Are they? Healthy? No, we, we got a sick one no. at home today. Sick at home. Never. No. All of our no. kids are sick. Never. Okay, we have yeah. sick kids. So Strep y'all can throat, relate. cold, yes. ear infection. Now, I could go on and on about both of these gals. Um, Jess is a, an incredible photographer, and uh, I call her social media influencer because she launched this thing called Stand for Life, which is amazing. Um, and uh, just incredible stuff. But you do, come on, you do a little photography for the gains, am I right? Chip and Joanna. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's real humble. But the greatest thing is that she loves Jesus a lot. Megan, you've come to know, some of you may not know that Carrie Pierce, you know, who often leads up here, and he is on the road. I mean, we've seen this resurgence of Jacko Pierce, and we celebrate that, which is amazing. But it's so cool. We're seeing more and more of our members stepping up to lead worship. Megan comes from a church in the D.C. area. Um, where she was leading, gosh, like 15,000 people are part of this church, multi-site church, and uh, worship leader, songwriter, and all that good stuff. Go on Spotify and check her out if you want to. Y'all didn't tell me to say that, but anyway. Okay, first, first, how about this? What, what's it been like? And both of y'all are yeah, ministers' kids, too, which is kind of fun for me. But Jess, what's it been like to grow up in the church, in a Baptist church, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. Um, I bet, like some of you, have had similar experiences to me. But growing up and having kind of this um, nature of a leader, I was very aware at a very early age. I can remember at like three and four being told that I was, I was kind of crossing some boundaries and crossing some lines that I wasn't supposed to cross as a little girl. Um, and that continued throughout my whole life. And it really hasn't been until the last like three or four years that God has really started opening my heart to question were those rule, rules culturally based or biblically based? And mm-hmm. I've started really working through that and struggling through that over the last few years. Very good. Okay. Megan, what about you? Uh, I think same as you, growing up with a lot of invisible lines, like you didn't really know what you could do, couldn't do, where you could go, what you could, where you couldn't go. Um, and so I grew up with that as well and then kind of just... Uh, uh, went on to be a worship leader in leadership and that uh, presents its own s- problems and, and struggles as well and as well as joys but just kind of experience the same just not knowing what are the lines what are my boundaries is it up here is it down here is it somewhere in the middle and everyone really does have their own opinion about that based on yes. <laughs> yeah. who you're talking to at any given time right so we're in the conversation a lot these days. We're going to continue to do so as we think. We want to remain uh, biblical, right, at the core and not let, not let culture ever drive what we're doing. So some of what we might do is counterculture around here. But did you all feel, I'm curious, did you feel like uh, along the way that um, men were receiving some, uh, what I'm seeing is a, is, a, is a really great thing in the church, where women are receiving a greater sense of theological guidance and direction where formerly it might have been, um, you can come to a point, but now that's the man's room, men are going to now learn about theology in the Bible. Did you catch some of that growing up? Yes. Yeah. I think uh, as as recently as, you know, three years ago, two years ago, just wanting to even audit certain 
um, theological conversations and just grow in my understanding. As Jeremiah says, like, if we have anything to boast in, it's that we know and understand God. And I want to do that. And so uh, wanting to even audit those things, not being even allowed to be in that room, mm. surely based on because being you're a, woman. a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How about this? What's it like to be a woman here at PCBC? What's it been like? Well, we Amazing. Um, <laughs> that's, okay, that's good. Right. Next question. Ad- awesome. <laughs> this is like an Instagram ad by Jeff. <laughs> Um, no, so I know, right. No, we came here from another local church that we really didn't see a lot of female leadership in. And when we came here about three or four years ago, honestly, the first time I was in the room, I was intrigued and surprised and, um, that I saw women leading, leading, um, with the Lord's supper, leading through giving, leading on the stage, uh, prayer, just all of it. And I was so, um, humbled and just drawn to this, that, that this church allows women to walk out their God-given callings. Um, and that's really, I, I mean, every Sunday I love seeing it. I really do. So a lot of people, you may not know this, and, and really one of the gals that we wanted up here, one of the women that we wanted here was Laura Dronzik, who is now our current um, lead deacon, I call her, you know, chairperson of our deacon fellowship. And she's an incredible leader. And she's out of town, but we were going to have her up here. But yeah, the highest level of lay leadership, if you will, she's in that role. So what about you? Uh, Honestly, Corey and I were talking about this uh, yesterday, just over this past few days of meeting with you, all of us meeting with you and talking through this of truly just feeling like I have had more of an extended hand. It's as if some of the male leadership in this church has have just said, okay, Megan, here's the hand. I want to extend it to you to be able to empower you to minister in the way that God has allowed you or God has gifted you to. And so I do feel empowered to minister in a way that I haven't really felt before. So thank you. And thank thank y'all. So uh, last question, what kind of church you, you have three boys, Mm -hmm. little ones, you have two girls. What kind of church do you want your boys to grow up in? What do you want them to see and experience in the body? Yeah, I mean, more than anything else, I want my boys to be in a church that loves the great commandment, that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and we love each other. We love our neighbors as ourselves, and um, and I so desire them to grow up in a church that honors each part of the body like we're talking about and that lifts hands up to parts of the body to step into those roles. Um, you know, we are called Christians as we're, we're little Christ and we're to mm-hmm. follow after that and we're to follow after, you know, how did Jesus treat women when he was here on earth? And it was putting them in places of impact. You know, the first two, the first people that ever saw that the, that the stone was rolled away was two women. And they, they were the ones that got to go share the gospel with the world, the good first news. Evangelist, right? The first evangelists yeah. were two women. Yep. And I just, I see that throughout scriptures that God just placed women in places of impact. And I want my boys to be in a church where we place women in places of impact, men and women alike, that we can serve alongside each other for the goodness, for the glory, for the edification of the gospel. Um, that's what I want for, for my boys. Awesome. What about you? Uh, That their womanhood would not create the boundaries around them, but that like uh, their personhood, who God created them to be from the beginning of time, who God ordained them to be, what he ordained them to do would be the boundaries. And so like equipping them for ministry, uh, looking at them as not male or female, but as a person, a child of God, that is their identity. Mm -hmm. And so you have people in the church saying, Willa. You are strong-minded, and you know what you know, and you know Jesus is good. Mm -hmm. How do we utilize that? And just saying, like, okay, I see you, and I want to help you become this woman of God to be utilized for the kingdom of God. So um, with kids older than y'all's kids, Stacey and I have seen our kids and girls, uh, twin daughters, flourish in their gifting. Um, And I want to be a church, friends, where we are calling girls and women to serve the Lord and to yes be scriptural and biblical and and sort through that but to empower all of us right or we miss more than half of the body if we're not releasing our women in leadership so we thought it'd be great today talking about the body we are male and female body and to talk about what that looks like we're going to talk more about that in the days to come but let's give these two gals a big uh, applause thank you so much thank you 
And I'm going to close us with this right here, and then I'll pray us out. Um, kind of next steps uh, as well. But before I get there, I just want to say this. I want to challenge all of us here. Women, listen. You are loved in this place. You matter. And God has gifted every one of you. When I find myself in a leadership uh, you know, conversation or meeting, and there are women in the room, the, 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 it, it takes a different posture. I'm telling you it does. And all for the good. For the betterment of the kingdom. But we're not simply, listen, if you're a man and you're a place of leadership, invite women into your space to talk, not just to be there, token women, but to listen to what they're saying. And I'll offer this to our men. Oftentimes women are stepping, stepping up and they're needed. And my challenge is, where are the men? Where are the men that God's calling out to lead? Because here's the thing, a lot of people want to go polarized on these issues, binaries of, if you study any of this, complementarian, egalitarian, women have a certain place over here and men have it, there's, and there's, there's boundaries around that. What I see in scripture is a crossover in a real way where I see in the home, the man is to be the head of the home. I mean, it's real explicit. But we've got to define head. He says, as Christ is the head of the church, the body. We're to be just like him. When we come into the church, there's a lot of conversations that we're having and need to have. We're going to remain thoroughly biblical in what we do. But we're going to continue to have this conversation and release every member in the body to take on their role, their part, so that we all can fight for unity. We can equip for ministry. And we can strive for maturity. Amen? Let's be that church. Amen. And praise the Lord. All right. So next steps. Here's how this looks. If you look at the bulletin, you can see there's a lot of people who joined our church in recent days. And if you'll just affirm those who've joined, they've talked to uh, someone. Let's just, let's just applaud those new members who've come to join us and say amen. Yes. Now, after, here's what they've done. They've stepped right over here into our next steps area. I'm going to be over there along with others. Love to talk to you further. We're going to continue this conversation going. We've asked uh, Megan, if y'all can, Jess, to be here at the front if you'd like to come talk to them. Email uh, some of us, you know, uh, Corey or Rodney or others in our staff. You just say, hey, I'd like to jump in on this. As you go younger into our church, Travis Cook with our young singles, lots of women in leadership in the ministry as you look down you go to alex wolf who does college ministry with us lots of girls are leading in that ministry and we continue to empower women and uh, what an exciting time this is in the life of our church so the only other thing i say is come back and join us next week as we kick off three weeks that are going to be intensive as we celebrate together what god's doing let's all stand together and i'll pray us out again would love to meet you and pray with you right over here so let me pray over us as we go Offer this benediction. And now, body of Christ, you go into this week and you use the gifts that God is giving you to point people to Him. And Lord, we we ask collectively, corporately, that we would be the church, that we would reach our fullest redemptive potential as a body, as every one of us do our part. Continue to help us to be healthy, We know the healthy things grow, continue to add to our body in these days ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen and amen.